ES Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm John Weeks and this is The Leader. We now know for sure energy bills are going up again significantly from the 1st of October. Ofgem revealed today the energy price cap for an average household has gone up from £1,971 a year to £3,549. That's equivalent in monthly costs of going from £164 to just under £300, and it's only expected to get worse. Independent forecasters reckon the cap could skyrocket to nearly £5,400 in January, and longer-term predictions suggest it could even hit up to £7,200 in April. The news has led to pleas from the likes of consumer champion Martin Lewis, unions, charities and even Ofgem themselves for the new Prime Minister, whether that's Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak, to provide more financial help for people across the country. So how have energy prices soared so high in the UK and what more could be done to help us all in the short and longer term? Tessa Khan, Director of Research and Advocacy Organisation Uplift, has helped to launch the Warm This Winter Coalition campaign, working to bring down energy bills now and in the future. She joins me now. So Tessa, we all knew this day was coming. Now we know officially the energy price cap will go up to £3,549. What do you make of it? Well, it's obviously a horrifying amount. And we know from multiple different independent agencies and bodies that that increase in people's energy bills is going to mean that millions of families and individuals across the country simply won't be able to afford energy this winter um, and that that's going to have catastrophic consequences um, across, you know, across the UK. But what I will say is that today's energy price hike announcement is almost to the pound what's been predicted for months. So I think that actually what's really shocking about today is that the government still doesn't have a plan, despite being on notice for so long that this has been coming, and yet we still have nothing to offer all of those households across the country who are now terrified about how they're going to pay for energy. And polls have shown around a third of households are already struggling to pay their energy bills. The National Union of Students has found a third of those at university are left with just £50 after paying rent and bills. All this without these energy prices going up. Surely help is needed as soon as possible, isn't it? Yeah, help help was needed months ago. I mean, as you've made clear, people are already struggling. And, you know, we've heard multiple stories about people taking all sorts of desperate measures just to prepare themselves for the increase in their energy bills, like selling household furniture. And, you know, obviously people are already just cutting down to the bone what they're buying in terms of food and other necessities. So, yeah, people need help right now. And I think, again, what is really shocking is that there are options on the table for the government to access revenue that could be distributed to households across the country, for example, through a proper windfall tax on oil and gas companies who are currently recording historic profits, but they're just failing to take advantage of those options. And the cause seems to be down to two main factors. The war in Ukraine pushing up wholesale gas costs and Russia turning off gas supplies to Europe. Which is more significant and more likely to hurt us in the long run? Well, actually, uh, I mean, we've been following gas prices very closely over the last year. And the reality is that they started to increase in September last year because of basically a crunch in global gas supply caused by a number of different factors, including a rebound in demand after COVID. So certainly, you know, Russia's war in Ukraine is definitely the principal cause, but it's not the only cause. And I think actually the more important point for people to realise is that energy bills in the UK are higher than any other European country. And that's because we are exceptionally reliant on gas. You know, the price of wholesale gas has increased 
tenfold roughly in the last six months or so. And we are paying a particular premium for that because 85% of households in the UK rely on gas for heating. Gas is a significant part of our electricity mix. So that's the real reason actually that we are suffering as much as we are. If we had a plan to reduce our reliance on gas, then we simply wouldn't be feeling the effects to the degree that we are. Ofgem has said today that it's working with ministers, consumer groups and industry on a set of options for the incoming prime minister. That sounds positive, doesn't it? It's hard to know really until we hear from the next prime minister exactly what their plan is. But certainly what we've been hearing from the most likely uh, next prime minister, Liz Truss, is deeply concerning. It really fails to grasp the scale of the crisis. And as I said, you know, this isn't just something that is going to affect people this winter. Global gas prices are predicted to stay high until at least 2025. So we've got to have a plan not just to protect people from the increase in their energy bills this winter and make sure that people aren't pushed into fuel poverty, but we've got to have a plan to get the country off gas and to make sure that we are making the most of, for example, the fact that renewable energy is currently nine times cheaper than gas and the government has an effective moratorium on onshore wind, for example. So we've got these abundant renewable resources that we aren't exploiting. That is the kind of thing that the government needs to do if it's serious. The other thing, the other reason that our energy bills are so high is because 15 million homes in this country, for example, are paying an extra thousand pounds on their energy bills because they're leaking so much heat through their windows, their roofs, their doors. So what we need is a national program to upgrade people's homes so that we no longer have some of the leakiest, coldest housing stock in Europe. As you said, there are several avenues we need to take in terms of boosting people's insulation and renewable energy. What strategies needed to make sure we're living in a much more sustainable way in the UK? Yeah, so I think, you know, the first thing to do is make sure we're not wasting energy so we can significantly reduce demand for energy by upgrading and insulating people's homes and bringing them up to a basic sort of level of energy efficiency. And then, you know, at the same time, we should be tapping into those abundant renewable resources, which can take, you know, months uh, to bring online. So that's a really quick fix. We are, you know, in terms of how much renewable energy we currently have in our electricity mix, we are way behind other countries who are getting by perfectly fine um, with significantly more renewable energy driving their their power grid. So that's also something that the government should do. What the government also should not do is look to the oil and gas industry, who are absolutely coining it at the moment because of gas prices, for solutions, because naturally they will advocate for increasing gas production through, for example, North Sea gas production or fracking. But the fact is, and this is something that both government and industry have acknowledged, more domestic gas production will not bring down the price of people's energy bills because that price is set in a global market in terms of how much we pay for gas. And there just isn't sufficient resource in the UK to make any difference at all to the problem that we're facing. It's a vanishingly small amount. So looking to that industry for solutions is a big mistake. And as I said, we should just be taxing them properly and moving on to the alternatives. Let's take a break now. Coming up in part two, Mike Childs from Friends of the Earth tells us it's feasible now to change how we get our energy. So we could be moving towards a renewable energy system using renewables, electricity based, so we're heating our homes with electricity, we're driving around in electric cars. That is all perfectly feasible. Joining me now is Mike Childs, Head of Science Policy and Research at Friends of the Earth. First of all, Mike, the price cap is going up again. What do you make of this situation? Well, it's extremely worrying because the reality is that Most people are going to be suffering from higher energy bills, but there'll be a significant proportion of people who are not just suffering, but are really choosing between heating and eating or even whether they can pay their rent and heat their home. And so, you know, there there is undoubtedly a, a, a crisis on our doorstep that needs resolving. Of course, it's also a reality that the UK has really bad quality housing. We haven't invested in improving the energy efficiency of our homes for decades so that's not helping in this situation where people switch on their heat 
large amount of it will just go straight out the walls of their homes and their, and their windows. So, you know, there's a real problem there as well. And the reality is, of course, we are a country that is hooked on large amounts of imports of gas, and that's what's driving this crisis. And we could have been building a lot more renewable energy over the last decade that wouldn't have eliminated this crisis in, in any shape or form, but it would have controlled it to some degree and made it less painful. And we see energy companies that claim to provide energy entirely from renewable sources, but they're upping their prices alongside all the others who don't. How does that work? Well, the reality is the price of electricity is tied to the price of gas. And many of the energy supply companies that, that sell us renewable energy, they don't produce that renewable energy themselves. They buy it from a market and the market is simply following the price of, of, of gas. So there's some problems with the market that need resolving. But also the vast majority of our homes are heated by gas. So even if you can buy renewable electricity, you know, those companies are selling you fossil fuel gas for heating your home. So we're still tied to those imports of gas. So fundamentally, we ought to be doing three things. We ought to be insulating people's homes. And, and we've identified the neighbourhoods that are most at risk from the energy crisis and are calling for the government to fund a street by street insulation programme within those. The second thing we need to do is to increase the amount of and the electricity we do consume from renewable energy, build more renewable energy plants, basically. A lot of our electricity still comes from gas. We've got huge scope for more renewable electricity generation. And the third thing we need to do that will take longer and will cost more, so it's not really going to help with the energy crisis right now, but is necessary, is we need to move away from gas heating to electric heating, by which we effectively mean heat pumps that use electricity to heat, heat our homes. So those three things need to happen. Right now in a crisis, of course, those three things can't stop all the pain that people are feeling. So there's a need for the financial kind of support that, that politicians are talking about now to try and help people through this winter. And of the three key things you mentioned there, the sort of biggest scale one seems to be moving to renewable energy. Ideally, I suppose, to 100%. How feasible is it for the new prime minister to say, we're going to build X amount of wind farms, X amount of solar farms, and we'll get it done by 2030, for example? Is that feasible or are there roadblocks in the way? We could be doing a lot more with, with renewable energy. And, and Boris Johnson, who will very soon be our former prime minister, of course, was eventually a big advocate for offshore wind, particularly despite when he wasn't prime minister, when he was writing for the Daily Telegraph, you know, he used to say that wind farms are no good and they couldn't knock the skin off a, a bowl of custard. You know, the reality is that these are amazing technologies and the, and the price of electricity they produce is incredibly low because of innovation and because of the scale of production of them, of them now. But there are challenges still to rolling out some renewables. So in England, at least, there are significant blockages for rolling out onshore wind. And, and both the candidates to be next prime minister, you know, Liz Truss and, and Rishi Sunak, have been negative towards onshore wind. They've also both been negative towards solar farms, despite solar farms only taking a tiny fraction of the UK's land up. And, and even if we increase them by two or three times, it would still be less than the land used for golf courses, for example. So, you know, they've both been negative to onshore wind, which are quick to build and are the cheapest. So offshore wind is absolutely brilliant. The UK has an abundance of offshore wind potential, particularly with innovations in floating offshore deeper so they can go in deeper waters. But there's things we could be doing now in terms of increasing the amount of renewables in the UK. So we could be moving towards a renewable energy system using renewables, electricity based. So we're heating our homes with electricity, we're driving around in electric cars. That is all perfectly feasible. The energy storage technology is coming on a pace, so we don't have to worry about when the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine. You know, those technologies coming forward to store energy, not just for the short term, for the hour or the day, but for weeks on end. So, you know, it is all possible. It's technically feasible. And you talk about those roadblocks. I know there are sometimes issues with how wind farms look. Legislation can sometimes be lacking for renewables. Are those the sort of roadblocks you're talking about when it comes to wind and solar? Or is there something else blocking them from happening? There are aesthetic objections to wind and solar. So there's no technical barriers. And those aesthetic objections can lead to political and policy or barriers, of course. And ultimately, they have done. The challenge, I think, is to recognise that many of the blockages in place were based on prejudice, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. You know, the reality is where wind farms are built now, or where these solar farms are built, actually, the local community are pretty happy with them. 
And now they understand, communities understand, that the alternative is we're hooked on incredibly expensive gas from overseas that's driven by a global market. So these kind of conflicts we see around the world can suddenly mean that gas price shoots up. And people think, well, actually, why aren't we using our homegrown energy potential here and clean energy? Because also large numbers of people, the vast majority of people, including the majority of conservative voters, don't think we should ignore the climate crisis when we're dealing with energy crisis. They think we should be dealing with both at the same time. So, you know, these roadblocks exist. Some of them are historical based on past views. And I think the new prime minister needs to come in and say, look, the reality is the UK can not only be energy independent, it can be an energy exporter if we embrace renewables. And obviously building big wind or solar farms will cost money. Do you know if any studies have been carried out that go through the costs and show how government money can be used or moved around to make them a reality? In the past, you go back 10 years, 15 years ago, renewable energy needed government subsidies to operate because the electricity it produced was more expensive than that from gas. But now that's not the case. Now renewable energy is the cheapest form of electricity. So you will get more wind, offshore wind, onshore wind, solar built. What those companies need is some kind of guarantee that they can sell their electricity though, because it's a very high upfront cost, a bit like nuclear power, very high upfront cost, and then the running costs are pretty low. So obviously companies want to, to say, well, actually, I'm gonna, I can build this thing, big up investment, I can get my money back over time. So that's why the government's got a, a mechanism called Contracts for Difference, which basically says, we'll agree a price for your electricity, you produce your electricity and sell it to us at that price. So, you know, that can be rolled out. The government needs to ramp up the number of rounds it has in terms of offering those contracts. And to be fair, over the last 18 months, it's, it's moved from saying we'll do it every two years to we'll do it every year and we'll make sure these rounds are a bit more generous. So we, again, we just need to get rid of some of these historic planning blockages and allow renewable energy to flow. And it, and it will do. The investment's there. It's a tried and tested technology. You know, there's, there, there should be no reason why we can't build a lot more, a lot more quickly. So what do you think it will take for the government and decision makers to say, OK, let's get on with it. Let's invest more in renewables in the UK? Often politicians are behind people in terms of their thinking. And the reality is that more and more people are saying, actually, we're very comfortable with renewable energy in our, in our backyard. Uh, and politicians are beginning to catch up on that. I think there is also a much stronger awareness amongst politicians that you know, renewable energy is now the cheapest form of energy. So let's get back in that. So I think there will be more support for renewable energy. Once we've moved past this weird phase where we've got two candidates, Prime Minister, talking to a very small segment of society and trying to throw promises towards towards them to get their votes. Actually, I think in reality, over time, then they'll recognise that, that renewable energy is absolutely the way forward and they'll back that. There's more on this story in the Evening Standard newspaper and online at standard.co.uk. That's The Leader. Thanks for listening. We're back on Monday afternoon at four o'clock.